The sermon text this morning is taken from Psalm 78. Psalm 78, I'll be reading the first eight verses. These are the words of the living God. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn, rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart right, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Let's pray together. Father, please make these words like well-driven stakes that connect and bind particular truths from your word to our lives in a potent way. Father, let us go from this place knowing what we must believe and therefore what we must do. And in particular, we ask that you would be pleased to continue binding many generations together in our midst, that we might honor one another and stand together against all the darkness. We ask for it in Jesus' name, and amen. Amen. I remember many years ago, a minister friend of mine uh, from out of town was in town and gave a message, and I, I don't recall the exact um, message altogether, but one of the things that he said that was very striking was that parents don't really get their report cards until they see their grandchildren thriving in the Lord. You know, it's, you know frequently it's just get them launched and not in jail. <laughs> but no, that's a very, very low bar, actually. The, the goal is not merely that they, uh, and we've said this in, in previous weeks, it's not merely that, um, that they wouldn't fall prey to the traps of the world. It's not merely that they, they would survive. It's not merely that they would grow up and avoid all the troubles of the world. Rather, we've said in previous weeks, now the goal is to actually send them into the world to trouble the world. We want to send them into the world to lay traps for unbelief. We want them to be not merely not trapped, we want them to be trappers. We, don't, we, don't, we not only want them to survive the attacks of the devil and the world and the flesh, we want them to be arrows. We want them to be missiles launched into the world. But that means then that what we're talking about is you're going to see that really clicking. You're going to see that uh, really uh, in a potent way and know that it's, it's the right thing and it's a good thing when they start having kids and their kids are growing up in the faith and their kids love the faith, love the Lord, even more than you or your kids did. That's the goal. That's the goal. So you don't really get your report card until you see your grandchildren thriving in the Lord. This means that our goal as parents should not only be to see our own children standing with us, inflicting damage on the kingdom of darkness, but also see our grandchildren standing with us and peace upon Israel. In Psalm 128, it says, you shall see your children's children and peace upon Israel. I don't think it just means you get to see them, as glorious as that is, but the fact that it's see them and peace upon Israel means you've seen them and they're part of the nation. They're part of the kingdom of priests. They're part of the worshiping people. You see your children's children, and you see them participating in the peace of Israel. So I want to look at these first eight verses in Psalm uh, 78, and then make a few particular applications uh, to the relationship between uh, uh, grandparents and grandchildren. So this is the fifth and final uh, message in this short five-part series, um, grandparents and grandchildren. 
It was uh, mentioned in the announcements earlier, but I'll just flag it again for you. The next two Sundays, we're doing the Great Preacher Shuffle between Christ Church and King's Cross with Pastor Jared and I um, uh, rotating. Uh, the f- next Sunday is Ascension Sunday, and the Sunday after that is Pentecost Sunday, so I, I believe our messages will be um, themed to those topics. And then the week after that, I'll be back to the book of Acts. For those of you wondering, yes, we're going back to Acts. So hold your horses. We're going to get there. Um, so, but this week, final message in this series, grandparents and grandchildren. This is a psalm of Asaph, psalm of Asaph, Psalm 78 is, uh, and it's a ballad about the sordid history of Israel, God's faithfulness, and the duty of grandparents to ensure that their grandchildren sing the praises of the Lord. That's the, the whole psalm. It's a long psalm, and you, you read the rest of it uh, later on. There's 72 verses. Um, But broadly speaking, it's about the sordid history of Israel, how they were not very faithful, how God continues to be faithful, has been faithful to his people over and over again, and broadly, it's about the duty of grandparents to ensure that their grandchildren sing the praises of the Lord. Like the father and the mother in Proverbs, there is an initial appeal to listen To the grandparents, this is how it begins, verse 1, give ear, O my people, to my law, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. If you know Proverbs, you know, hey, that's Proverbs, that's that's Proverbs. Whereas in Proverbs, it's primarily a father and a mother speaking directly to children. Here we know within a couple of verses that these are, this is grandparents. Grandparents are saying, listen to me. Grandparents are saying, listen to me. Uh, down in verse 6, that he, he says that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, and that they should arise and declare them to their children. Right. So these are, these are grandparents saying, listen carefully, listen carefully, verse 1. And what they say, it says, is a parable, or a dark saying, or what's sometimes translated as a riddle. It's a riddle from of old. That's verse 2. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter dark sayings of old. Parables are stories that make someone wise. That's broadly what you could describe a parable as. A parable is a story that if you understand it, will make you wise. It's no accident that the Hebrew word that's that for parable, mashal, is closely associated with, if it's turned into a verb, it, it, it can mean tell a parable, but often it actually means to rule as a king. It means to rule as a king. So think of Solomon, for example. Solomon is a king, and, but he becomes king and immediately prays to God and says, I'm, I'm too young for this job. I don't understand how to rule this, such a great people. Please give me wisdom. And then God gives him wisdom, and God says, because you didn't ask for riches or the life of your enemies or all these other glories, I'm going I'm to pile up the glories upon you. But in particular, I'm going to give you wisdom. And then there in 1 Kings 3, immediately he has a a test of that with the two prostitutes that are fighting over uh, the the baby, the living baby. And, And so wisdom and rule go together. Wisdom and rule go together. And the word parable actually holds it together. A parable is a story that if you understand it, it will make you wise. And think of wisdom here then as wisdom to rule. Wisdom to distinguish between things, wisdom to make wise decisions, and to rule well. So the grandparents say, listen, I've got something to tell you, and if you understand it, if you listen carefully, you'll be wise and you'll be equipped to rule. Older folks naturally tell stories, and this is their duty. They've seen a lot, they've heard a lot, they have a thing or two to say, and it's their job. It's their job to talk. It's their job to tell us the stories. It's a great sin to hide the wonderful works of the Lord from your grandchildren. It's a great sin to hide the wonderful works of the Lord from your grandchildren. You need to talk. You need to tell them. And the reason why it's a great sin to hide the wonderful works of the Lord from your grandchildren because, is, is because it will result in less praise to the Lord. That's verse 4. We will not hide them from, our, from their children. And this is your grandchildren. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. Right? 
So what is, what is, what's the point of telling the wonderful works of the Lord? That they would praise the Lord. That they would hear the wonderful works of the Lord and praise the Lord with you. They would hear what God has done and worship with you. This all goes back to God's own self-revelation and testimony that he intended for parents and grandparents to pass down to children and grandchildren. We see this in verses 5 and 6. So this goes back to God's own testimony. God is the one who started the story. God is the one who started it in the very beginning. But here in the history of Israel, he began it particularly at Sinai. And he established a testimony in Jacob, appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. So this all began with God's own testimony, his own self-revelation, and the goal is for it to be passed down, generation to generation, parents to children, and children again to parents, and so on. Done rightly, this is to teach each generation to set their hope in God and not forget him, like so many previous generations. We see this in 7 and 8. Verse 7 says that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. How are, how are they to not forget? Their grandparents are supposed to be talking about it all the time, and their parents all the time, so they don't forget. So they hope in God and keep his commands. So they might not be, notice there's another set of fathers here, another set of grandparents even, might not be as their fathers a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, whose spirit was not steadfast with their God. So the hearts of grandparents. It's the temptation of the young to reject the wisdom of the old. That's, that's the temptation of the young. The temptation of the young is to reject the wisdom of the old, but it is the temptation of the old to grow bitter and resentful. It's the temptation of the older to grow bitter and resentful frequently about that. They just don't listen. If I told him once, I told him twice, doesn't just ping pong ball off his forehead, right? And, and what, so the temptation of the young really is to reject the wisdom of the old, but the temptation of the old is to grow bitter, resentful, hardened. So, well, what does it matter? Apathetic? Doesn't matter. They don't listen. It doesn't matter. Everything's getting worse. And so on. So the longer your life, the more hard things you carry. The longer your life, the more hard things you carry. That's true. But the temptation is to either let those hard things weigh you down, make you bitter, make you angry, make you depressed, make you apathetic, or else, maybe even in the midst of all that, you simply try to escape. You try to escape. So you get angry on the one hand, or bitter, or you just try to escape. In one direction, you're giving in to those hard things. You're giving in to anxiety. You're giving in to fear. You're giving in to anger. You're giving in to bitterness. Or in the other direction, you, may try to be, you, might, you might be trying to bury those fears, those frustrations, that bitterness, in various empty pursuits. And, of course, there's all kinds of temptations offered to the retirement community. All kinds of ways that you're, you're invited to escape the hardships of life. And it's a temptation. You need to know that just in the same way that the world is offering young people, whatever, sex, um, you know, get-rich-quick schemes, whatever, all these things, um, popularity, whatever, the, the, the same, th there's offers for older people. Turns out older people have, usually have a little bit of money, and they'd like your money. And they'd, li they'd be happy to help you hide from the hard things, try to help you ignore the hard things. And so you might be tempted to bury your fears and frustrations in empty retirement pursuits. Maybe it's the, you know, whatever, it's, it's golf every day, 24-7. Um, maybe it's uh, fluffy entertainment uh, shows, TV all day long, every day. Maybe it's the next travel adventure, trip after trip after trip. Of course, there's nothing wrong with the game of golf every now and again. There's nothing wrong with uh, some good, healthy entertainment. There's nothing wrong with some travel. But you need to know that 
the, as, you, as you age and as you finish your ordinary labors and you have more time and you have more money, um, this is a temptation to you, particularly as things that you carry if you've not processed them well, if you've not processed them right. Hard things, difficult things, and it's tempting to want to either get angry, frustrated, bitter, or try to drown them in some kind of pursuit, some kind of empty pursuit. In either direction, you're failing to tell your children and grandchildren the wonderful works of God. If what's consuming you is all the hard things, all the things that haven't gone right, all the things that gone poorly, all the ways in which whatever you failed or other people around you failed, you're going hard, hardened, and darkened, well, you're not, then what's going to be on your heart and mind? What's going to be on your mouth? Bitterness. Not the wonderful works of God, bitterness. Or else, if it, and, and you say, well, that's ugly, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in for fluffy TV shows and, and anything but that. Well, again, what are you talking about? Are you constantly talking about the, the, the golfing game? Are you constantly talking about um, the latest um, what, whatever fluff movie? Are you, are you talking about the next travel destination? Is that all you're talking about? Or are you talking about the wonderful works of God? While longer life brings these temptations, by the same token, the longer your life, the more good things you carry. You, do you carry hard things? Yes. But the longer your life, with the eyes of faith, the more you carry good things. If you've been walking with God longer, then you've seen God at work longer. You have more to say. You have more to share. And this should translate into more joy, more gratitude, more patience, more wisdom. Right? You should have more. Right? Every day, every month, every year. With eyes of faith looking around, you should be seeing God's goodness more and more, and so you should have more to share. And the gospel teaches the older generation to do this regardless of how it seems to be received. Right? What, what, is the, what is the gospel? The gospel is not... Well, you were such nice, decent people that God came to you, and no, <laughs> that's not the gospel at all. The gospel is you were dead in your sins and trespasses, you hated God, you were his enemy, and he came for you, and you didn't want him to. It's not, it's not like you were like, God, don't you have some good news for me? No, you didn't want the good news, you hated the good news, and God came for you with his gospel anyway. Right? This, this is the logic of the gospel over and over again. You don't forgive someone because you think they're deserving. <laughs> no. You don't love someone because they've earned it. The gospel is that we give simply because we've already received far more than we deserve from God himself. And so we give and we give and we give. And, and, and Jesus says, you're to love and don't expect anything in return. Pour it out. Because that's how you've been loved. And so the same principle applies here, right? The older generation is called to talk about the wonderful works of God, talk about all the good things of God, and keep talking, and who cares what it seems like they're doing? <laughs> you say, but I, you know, I, I'm giving them wisdom, and it's just, they're not getting it. Well, first of all, you don't know that. You don't know that. You don't know how much is actually going in there. Keep giving. But secondly, it's, regardless of the impact, your job is to be obedient. Your job is to be obedient and leave the results to God. If nothing else, you talking about the mighty works of God is good for you. What are you cultivating in your heart? Are you cultivating gratitude? Are you cultivating joy? Are you, are you cultivating counting up all the good things of God every day, every month, every year that God gives you? and praising him with it. Look, if you do that and, and there's no one else in the world listening, guess what? God loves it. God is glorified by you praising him for the good things. Now, guess what? In most instances, you got people around you. Kids, grandkids, neighbors. Tell them. Tell them. And who cares what it looks like it's doing? The gospel teaches the older generation to do this regardless of how it seems to be received. Do it anyways. But remember also that that's precisely what God used to break your hard heart. Your heart, was, your heart was hard, made of stone, 
and God spoke good words to you. God spoke good words to you, and that's what he used to soften you. So don't give up. Keep giving praise. Now, since we're all made for fruitful work and industry, our general goal should be to work hard until we can't. That's what we're made for. We're made in the image of God, and immediately we were given work to do. Six days of work, one day of rest. So our general goal should be to work hard until we can't. This hard work can and will take different forms over the decades. It will take different shapes. This is not, this is not a command that you have to have the exact same job uh, un until you die. But, uh, so it can and will take different forms over the decades. But the modern American expectation of retirement at 65 and spending your life savings on RVs and cruises is a great evil. It's a great evil. It's, it's, again, it's part of this temptation. Look, you, you've worked hard. You deserve this. Now it's okay for you to be lazy and uh, blow your life savings. No, Proverbs 13 says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of a sinner is laid up for the just. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Right? You've seen the, you know, the really wicked bumper sticker on the back of the massive RV that says, you know, this is my kid's inheritance. Right? What? Right? That, that's, they're just burning it. Burning it. This inheritance should ordinarily include financial and material provision. This is, we're not Gnostics. We believe that God made the world. He made good things, and people need, children and grandchildren need uh, uh, resources with which to live and serve the Lord and their families. In, in 2 Corinthians, Paul alludes to this uh, by way of analogy. He says, Behold, the third time I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours but you, for the children ought not lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. 2 Corinthians 12, 14. In the ordinary course of things, this is how God made the world. Parents are laying up an inheritance for their children and grandchildren. And this inheritance, of course, should also include the wisdom you've learned, telling the wonderful works of God. Ecclesiastes 7.11 says that an inheritance with wisdom is good. An inheritance with wisdom is good. So think of your work now, and if you're already in uh, the um, later years, if you've maybe finished one career and you're working at other things, you want to be thinking to yourself, what I'm doing is trying to um, leave as much as I possibly can uh, of a blessing to my children and grandchildren. This is material provisions as well as wisdom. We live in a land that has rejected the inheritance of our grandfathers, and we've done this perhaps most insidiously in how we have sent them away to nursing homes and allowed the government to fund and oversee their care. Right? We, this is perhaps one of the gravest, greatest sins, honestly, as a nation that we have committed. We have sent our grandparents and great-grandparents away to nursing homes and allowed the government to fund and oversee their care. I think one of the great blessings of the whole COVID insanity um, was that it revealed some of this to us. Where, where were some of the hardest hit places? Nursing homes. And some of that was caused by massive bureaucratic um, incompetence. But who put them there? We did. We did. Right? Who, who's, who's God given to care for their grandparents and great-grandparents in their older age? Well, ordinarily, it ought to be their family. Ordinarily, it ought to be their family. Their family ought to be at least intimately involved. The last memory I have of, of my wife's grandparents is um, waving to them and talking to them through outside glass in their, in their nursing home. And uh, we were able to, we were allowed to hand a cell phone in, because cell phones, you know, are very, very clean. <laughs> you know that's safe. And we could talk to them through glass. We did that as a nation, as a culture, right? 
We said, no, let's outsource that. Let's outsource that. The COVID insanity was perhaps one great wake-up call that this system is completely bankrupt. We have done a civil version of what the Jews had done in the first century, counting money paid into a system as some kind of substitute for actually caring for our parents and grandparents in old age. Remember, Jesus went off about this in the Gospels. He says, You're, you've used the traditions of men to set aside the clear commands of God. God said, God said that you're to honor your father and mother. God said that if you curse your father and mother, that you should be liable to the death penalty. But you've said if you give this certain money in and you call it Corbin, then you're free of all obligation to care for your parents. Right. So this is, this is not a new temptation. We've done it before. People of God have done it before. And God hates it. Of course, there are sometimes health needs that require medical assistance. And, and so we ought to seek to provide for that. But nevertheless, it should be far more normal for our grandparents to end their days surrounded by their people before being gathered to their people. That should be the norm. The norm should be surrounded by your people in order to be gathered to your people. And part of the reason for this is because of what they have to say. I mean, you know, it's, it's not just the, the travesty of, of incompetent care. It's not just the travesty of isolation. It's not just those travesties. That, that's bad enough. But you know what else? We don't, we're, we've been cut off from their wisdom. We've been cut off from their wisdom. Right? Why, why, are we, why is our land such a wreck? Because we send all the wise people away. We, sent them all, we said, we don't want to listen to you. We'll come visit you once in a while, of course. We'll listen to you for a couple minutes. We've, we've sent the wisdom away. Rather than inviting the wisdom in. Rather than saying, we want more of this. You've seen more than we have. You know more than we know. Tell us about the wonderful works of the Lord. In, in Genesis 49, as Jacob is finishing his life, he gathers all, the, all his sons together and he blesses them all before he goes to be with the Lord, before he is gathered to his people. Right? We want to have, have them around because they have wisdom. Children's children are the crown of old men. Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. Proverbs 17, 6. Shouldn't, there, shouldn't the crown, shouldn't they be near their crowns? <laughs> Should, shouldn't, we, shouldn't we be near? Shouldn't, be cl shouldn't we be close by? Shouldn't we allow our fathers and grandfathers that glory? The glory of young men is their strength, and the beauty of old men is the gray head, Proverbs 20, verse 29. Or this from Leviticus 19. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am the Lord. It doesn't seem like an accident to me at all that as we sent our parents and grandparents away, what were we doing? We were sending the Lord away. Right? We, were, we were saying, we don't fear you, Lord. And it's right there in the law. It's right there in Leviticus. How do you show that you fear God? How do you show that you honor the Lord? Well, you stand up when an old man walks in. You stand up in the presence of your elders. You stand up recognizing that these people have seen more of the world, know more of God than you do. And so they deserve honor and respect. It's not, a, it's not an accident. As we sent them away, we were also telling God, please go away. We don't want your wisdom. And so we sent them away. All of this teaches us that there's great glory in pursuing life together over generations. There is great glory in pursuing life together over generations. Now, sometimes because of sin or tragedy, this must be started over. Sometimes you, you don't know your parents. Sometimes um, there's some great sin or tragedy, early death or whatever, and you don't, you're separated or they're gone. And, and so this must be started over. And, but that too should be embraced in faith. Right? Whether, whether you are in good fellowship with your parents or your grandparents or not, whether you're the, the first Christian in your family as far as you know, 
Um, remember Abraham. God, God called Abraham out of his homeland, away from their families, and then his, his father actually dies on the way, and Abram goes into this new land, and he's it. And remember, he doesn't, he doesn't have any kids yet either. It's him and his wife. Sometimes God calls us to start over and remember the glory of Abram. The glory of Abraham is that he believed God. He believed God. God said, you see the stars? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make your family like that. They're going to be like, they're going to be rulers in the nations, and in your seed all the families of the earth will be blessed. And Abraham believed God. And so wherever you are, and sometimes it's in the middle, sometimes you, you, you have family, but maybe you're not as close as you wish, well, believe God. Why did Jesus come? He came to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Right? He came to take the curse that resides in all our families. He came to take it away. And as he takes it away, what your job is to believe is that the only thing left is blessing. That's all that's left. If the curse is taken, your sins are confessed, you've done everything you can to be right, then you're to look to God and say, I'm hungry for your blessing. Let it be upon me. Let it be upon my children. Let it be upon my grandchildren. Knit us together. And never forget that God puts the solitary in families. Psalm 68, 6. God puts the solitary in families. God puts the orphans in families. I was talking to a friend one time who was a first-generation Christian, and he just said, you know, talking about how just, you know, was kind of, you know, just saying, I love how, you know, your, your, your parents are Christians, and and you've got all this legacy, and he says, we just don't, I just don't have that legacy. And I looked at him, and I said, actually, you're wrong. You're part of the covenant people of God. Are you not? And when you come into the people of God, guess what? You get fathers and mothers and grandfathers and grandmothers. And if you're on the other end of that, you say, well, I, I didn't have any kids, or I, don't, I, don't, I, I, I was never married, or I, I don't know my kids, or they, whatever. Guess what? Look around. These, these are your children. These are your grandchildren in the Lord. This is why we take those baptismal vows. This is why we take these membership vows. We, 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 are, we are family in the Lord. God puts the solitary in families, and he's given you an inheritance. He's given you an inheritance in the church, in the saints. Look around. These are your people. Right? This is what Jesus said. You know, your, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. He said, Everyone who does the will of my father, my, my mother, my brother, my sister. And you see? You say, well, I, I, don't, I don't have a Christian family. I don't know what it's like to have a Christian family. Yes, you do. Open your eyes. Look around. This is your family. These are your people. The Lord puts the solitary in families. There was a gentleman many years ago that I... Uh, you maybe heard me tell this story before, but there's a, a gentleman, uh, uh, someone in our congregation met from a local nursing home named Jim and uh, brought him to church one Sunday and he uh, started coming and uh, met him and I started going over to the nursing home. He taught me how to play pinochle and I played pinochle with him probably like for four or five years and there some, a couple other gentlemen there and uh, a couple years into it, he pulled me aside and, and he's a single man never married, no kids, had some relatives kind of, I don't know, somewhere around, but they weren't really involved. And he said, he used to say to me, just pull me aside, he'd kind of have a little bit of, hit. I think he had a stroke at one point, so a little bit of a speech impediment, but he would just look at me really intently and say, Toby, I used to be so, so angry. He says, now, now I'm happy. I'm, I'm so happy. And he would just say that really intently at me, and then he'd say, have a good day. <laughs> and uh, and, and, we, and, we, and he explained at various points. He says, yeah, he says, I, I was so angry at God. And then you all started bringing me to church. And, and I love it. He said, and I, when the last, he, uh, when, he, when he was passing away, when he was dying, I went and visited him. And he had, couldn't talk anymore. And it was at the point where you're just keeping his lips moist. And I uh, read some scripture with him, and one of the very last things I asked him, I said, Jim, are you still happy? And he nodded very vigorous at me. <laughs> and that's all he could do. And then he went to be with the Lord. The Lord puts solitary in families. 
As with all glory, glory is heavy. Glory is heavy. And that means there will be challenges. You know, it's glorious and sweet to talk about all these things, but of course, life's challenging. Life's challenging. But the goal should be honor. Honor, honor, honor. It's glory, glory, glory. That's what you should be thinking to yourself. This is glorious. And so life together, there's bumps, there's tensions, there's places where you're trying to, you know, you're trying to do the dance of the in-laws or the dance of the the daughter-in-law or the mother-in-law or the son-in-law or the grandchildren. You're trying to do the dance and you step on each other's toes. And, And you try again and you step on the toes again and you try. But remember, it's glory. Remember, it's glory. Think honor. So parents, parents, honor your parents. Honor your parents so that your children will learn how. Parents, honor your parents so that your children will learn how. Don't roll your eyes at them. Don't talk behind their back ugly. (laughs) Honor them. Speak highly of them. And even when there's strain, even when there's tension, you can talk truthfully about it. If they're not believers or things like that, you need to talk truthfully, yes, but honor. Honor them. No, your children should know. You love them. You think highly of them. You're doing everything you can to honor them. Grandparents, honor your children, the parents of your grandchildren, so that they will learn how. Honor your children, the parents of your grandchildren, so they will learn how. Every family has to learn their own dance. Every family's got to figure this out. And there's different family cultures and so forth and personalities, and that should all be taken into account. But some of the very basic principles should be warmth and space. Warmth and space. Very warm, very warm. And give one another room. Give one another room. This is, this, you, you can't exist, it's, it's, don't smother. <laughs> don't smother with that warmth. Lots of warmth and give room. And then you've got to figure it out in the details. How, how often does that mean we're over at each other's houses or how often do we visit and how long do we visit and do we stay at the house or do we stay at a hotel or, you know, whatever. All the, those details have to be worked out. But warm, warm, warm. And then remember, be respectful of space. Give yourself warmly to one another, joyfully, gratefully, and freely. Give it free. Remember the gospel. Right? Freely, he's given to you. So freely give. Give it freely and don't, don't, remember Jesus says, don't require anything in return. You know, not even for grandma. (laughs) Grandma, give like Jesus gave to you. Give. Give freely, gladly, openly. And trust. What does Jesus say when he says that? He says, it will be given back to you. Pressed down. Shaken. Overflowing. Right? Trust God. As you give, don't grasp. As you give, don't demand. Give, love freely. They, if they need more space than you think, you say, okay, no worries, no fun. I'm here. Love freely. Give freely, gratefully. Then recognize also that space needs to be given for individual families to exist. Don't meddle. Don't meddle. Assume the best. Assume the best. Believe the best. And then, of course, keep short accounts. No grudges building up. No bitterness growing up. Remember, either you cover it in love or you confront it in love. Keep short accounts. No long list of things. Well, you know, that one time when she did this. And remember on that Thanksgiving? This is three Thanksgivings in a row. No. That's keeping accounts. Do not do that. Keep short accounts, meaning as soon as something gets on your list, go make it right. And you make it right either by covering it in love, that's like dropping it into the volcano of the cross, right? Once something's in there, it's gone, right? It's gone. If you cover it in love, you say, I don't even know what you're talking about. It's gone. You've covered it in love. Or if if, if it really does need to be addressed, then you confront it, but you confront it in love, in gentleness, Taking the log out of your own eye first before you go to address the speck 
in their, li- in their eye. Many of our cultural commentators have pointed out that our land is suffering from a great spell of amnesia. Our land is suffering from a great spell of amnesia. We have forgotten who we are. We don't know who we are. We've forgotten what God did for us in this land, for our families, for our ancestors. And while there has been great evil done in the younger generations, rejecting the wisdom of our parents and grandparents, it must be said that there has also been great evil in the older generations, refusing to tell their children and grandchildren, having stubborn and rebellious hearts. This evil, there's more than enough sin to divvy up for all of us. But the central theme of Psalm 78, the central theme of Psalm 78 is the faithfulness of the Lord. The faithfulness of the Lord. It's the sordid history of Israel. They forget. They rebel. They disobey. But if you keep reading through the rest of the psalm, it's all about the faithfulness of the Lord, his mercies, his compassion. Okay? In, in fact, in, in verses 37 to 39, it says, Their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. They weren't right. 38, but he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yea, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, wind that passes away and comes not again. Notice that. We don't remember God. We forget God. God never forgets. God remembers, remembers his steadfast love, remembers his compassion, remembers his mercy. And if he did that for Old Testament Israel, how much more does he do that for those of us in Jesus Christ, his own son? How much more does he remember mercy in his own son? And this is, of course, what drives our praise. The central thing, the the mighty works of God that we're talking about The mighty works of God fundamentally are, it's his mercy that he remembers. He remembers his people, and then we forgot, and then he remembered us again, and then we forgot, and then he remembered us again, and then we we turned to idols, and then he delivered us. That's, those are the mighty works of God, and this is what drives our praise. He is our faithful father, the God of our fathers, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, and his faithfulness always gives us something to talk about. His faithfulness always gives us something to talk about, even something to sing about. In Psalm 103, it says, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness to children's children. Father, we thank you for all our parents and grandparents who came before us because we know that through them you have given us this great and precious gift called life. We thank you especially for those who have gone before us, who have known you, and who have left us a glorious inheritance. Father, help us to walk worthy of that great honor and grant us the great gift of generations of faithfulness, faithfully telling your mighty works even to our grandchildren. And we ask for this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, singing. Part of maturity growing up is coming to understand what you lack and what you need. Even in a perfect world, God brought the universe into greater maturity each day, seeing what the previous work he had done still needed. So light and darkness and day and night were good on the first day, but you know what they really needed was a firmament. And the firmament needed stars and planets and birds to fly across it. The water and dry ground, the seas and land were good, but the water needed fish And the dry ground needed lots of animals. And when God created Adam, he brought the animals to him because, well, they needed names. And in the process of naming all the animals, Adam realized he needed a helper. God's solution to the needs of even a perfect world has always been one of dividing and filling. He divided light from darkness. He divided waters above from waters below. He divided waters from dry ground. And then he filled those spaces with stars and birds and fish and animals. And likewise, when Adam understood his need for a helper, God put him in a deep sleep and divided the rib from his side and then formed the woman from that rib and then brought her to the man and filled the void in his life with her beauty and friendship. 
Now, sin and death, of course, complicates this process, but God still basically works the same way. A child needs to separate from his mother's womb in order to be born and be filled with more life. Children grow up as we sense their need to learn and become responsible, new tasks and duties and classes. And when they grow up, they sense their need to work and make homes of their own and marry, and so they divide from us again and then are filled with more good things. And so the simple exhortation this morning is that this meal is for those who know they need to grow up more into Christ. Do you know your need for grace? That you need more wisdom? You need more love? Then come. But notice that once again, God is showing you how he intends to do this. He breaks the bread and he pours out the wine. In Christ, he intends to break certain things in you and in your life in order to grow you up, in order to fill you with more of his goodness. Maturity understands this. Maturity says, yes, Lord, thank you, and welcomes that. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ.